Welcome to the This Week in Clean Tech podcast. Each week we speak to a leading CEO, executive, thought leader, or insider in the clean tech sector. Each guest shares their thoughts on recent events, their own clean tech story, and their vision and hopes for the future. This week, our host, David Hunt, is joined by Marek Kubik, Market Director of Energy Storage Technology and Services Company, Fluence. Marek leads Fluence's UK and Ireland client solutions team and is responsible for overseeing energy storage sales and project proposals across UK and Ireland, the Middle East, and Africa. He has nine years engineering and sustainability experience, including an instrumental role in the UK's first commercial battery storage array in 2015, and more recently, a record-breaking UK 120 megawatt energy storage portfolio transaction, the largest in the world to date. A tech futurist and TEDx speaker, Marek was also named a 2017 honoree of the Forbes 30 Under 30, a list that recognizes important young entrepreneurs and industry leaders. Before we start, a reminder that you can subscribe to the This Week in Clean Tech podcast via iTunes or all of the other usual avenues. But for now, let's hand it over to David Hunt with his guest this week, Marek Kubik. Thank you for joining us on the uh, This Week in Clean Tech podcast uh, today, Marek. I, I know from previous discussions and from your TEDx talk, actually, that uh, much like me, you're passionate about the electrification of everything uh, and uh, a world powered entirely by renewables. So it's been a, 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 a quite a, a, an interesting few stories that you flagged up for us to uh, to discuss this week, largely around uh, solar and storage solutions and the uh, death of the fossil fuel peaker plant, which would be a, a great thing. But before we move on to those stories, I just wanted to get your thoughts on 2018, which was quite a significant year in itself. Um, what, what were your thoughts of the sort of significant moments or events from 2018 for energy storage? Sure. Well, 2018 was uh, was a big year for uh, for us at Fluence because it was actually our first year as a, as an organisation. Um, so it, it it flew by actually very um, quickly, but we've we were active on a on a lot of fronts, and I guess a few of the things that um, that that jumped out um, for me from that uh, is one new applications for energy storage, which are we're increasingly seeing in other markets, so both in the U.S. and in Australia. We uh, we deployed projects uh, last year for for different customers that are essentially alternatives to traditional transmission and distribution infrastructure. Um, so in Australia, for instance, uh, we deployed a 30 megawatt project, um, a place called Ballarat in, in Victoria, and that is um, essentially being owned and uh, operated by the network company there to relieve certain congestion on, okay. on the grid, but then it's being leased to third parties for, for playing in the energy market. So really interesting sort of stuff. and. Uh, Certainly, as we're, we're looking at the UK for future applications for storage, uh, there's lessons learned in in those sort of markets for that. And similarly, in in the US, uh, we deployed projects for um, uh, Arizona Public Service, which is a utility in uh, in the states that again you, is using a battery as a direct alternative to having to build a 20 mile um, uh, transmission line to uh, to be upgraded in, a, in an area. Okay. So those are really interesting applications. Um, we also had, uh, and I guess this will come on to uh, you know the, the more recent discussions. But uh, at the start of uh, of uh, 2018, we launched this new platform of, uh, of a DC coupled energy storage platform, and solar and storage is increasingly becoming a bigger thing in in uh, certain markets around the world. Yeah, and you know, in the UK as well, of course, it was it was also a pretty big big year. There was a shift from all these sort of first frequency regulation projects, which are often the way that, that markets are open, uh, to a sort of growing maturity recognition that, that sort of market is saturating, but there are a lot more deeper applications you can um, you can provide from energy storage. Uh, so these more um, merchant markets uh, yeah. providing balancing and, and so on. And um, I guess personal highlight for me from that was the 120 megawatt portfolio we signed with with uh, UKPR, um, which is uh, biggest transaction of even the world globally on on this basis for providing precisely those sort of services to uh, uh, to the grid. So there's a lot of activity on on sort of all fronts and certainly all the mature energy storage markets around the around the world. 
Yeah, and that's what uh, I guess the the challenge is. I was in uh, the US last week talking with an energy storage developer there, but uh, uh, not just you have inter-country, uh, uh, obviously, uh, differences, you have interstate differences, but it does seem that uh, in many locations, uh, funding to uh, and, and finding the right revenue stack to, to get projects underway uh, does seem to have uh, turned a bit of a corner. Yeah, I mean, there's it's obviously very market dependent, and it's also very application dependent what makes the most sense. Um, in, in certain US states, you still have this, this uh, long-term contract structure and you can still do this with solar and storage, so sort of PPA type ag- arrangements. Mm-hmm. And when you have a sort of 20-year contract and a definite use case for that 20-year period, it, it, it creates a very different um, balance of, of, of interests on which aspects of the design to focus on and, and uh, you know what you should do. If you've got a predictable use for a long time, it's it's easy to design a system um, to, to be augmented over time. For instance, if you have a merchant system where there's volatility and there's opportunities to use it more or less um, and you don't know how long you want it to last because uh, you know the, the, the revenue opportunities aren't certain for any long term, mm. uh, it's quite a different balance. And, uh, and so we've been focusing, for instance, in the UK a lot more on, on, on those sort of merchant projects and how do, you, uh, how do you design an energy storage system to, to best capture the, uh, the value that the market has when you yeah. don't know what the asset's going to do. Um, so it's a lot more about what we call flexible warranties and, and designing a system to be able to use for different things rather than saying, you know, here's a system, it can do this one job, which is yeah. ultimately how, you know, the first projects in many markets emerge for, for instance, for frequency regulation. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things as well. People who are experienced in uh, renewable uh, project development, uh, as much as there are, not saying not without complexity, but but certainly once you look at storage uh, in any given market, the whole uh, dynamic is is significantly more complex and uh, as you say, much more difficult to pick and choose the right markets for the right solution that you have. But it's, in terms of from you mentioned sort of Australia, the US, uh, the UK, are they the more main markets that you're active in presently at uh, Fluence? Yeah, so those are the ones we see the the most activity uh, and and sort of immediate uh, growth in. I'd say those plus uh, Germany as well, which is uh, you know where one of our two main uh, headquarters is, uh, are all very active markets. Um, and there are plenty of others that, uh, that that are sort of interesting, but but those ones, are, um, in the US in particular, has been paving the way for quite quite some time. Uh, but the UK has really accelerated, and, and Australia similarly. So uh, I, I'd say that yeah, those are the ones that are interesting um, for very different reasons. Um, and particularly the the US, as you said, it's it's a very different and diverse collection of uh, of problems in different states to be solved. Mm. One that uh, jumps out, of course, in one of the stories you, you you sent across, touching back on that PPA thing, was uh, Hawaii and uh, the the uh, announcement, certainly of uh, tenders being put in for solar and storage down at eight dollar cents uh, uh, level, and that that. It seems quite significant. What was it about that in particular that uh, that caught your eye and uh, flagged that to your attention? Well, uh, in in that specific case, it's uh, and these are not my words. These are the uh, Wood McKenzie's, the analysts that, that look at it. those are sort of mind blowing uh, low low PPA prices to be coming out when you're looking at solar with storage as a you know as a combined package. Yeah, uh, we've seen in the in the US last year, um, or well, and in in other places, but particularly Arizona, Nevada, the sort of tenders that are being run there for PPAs of solar prices of of twenty dollars a megawatt hour, which is you know does solar on its own ridiculously low prices um, and you know certainly much lower than um, gas which would be more around 50 to 80 80 dollars per megawatt hour but what makes the the solar plus storage particularly interesting is that it gives you the firm you know a dispatchable resource again it's sort of duration yeah. limited but it's much like uh, comparable comparative to a peaking uh, peaking generator and if you're able to build that cheaper than uh, you know the tradi- a traditional peaker, then uh, you know suddenly that's a, a seismic shift in the you know future direction of the energy industry. Uh, Hawaii is particularly interesting in that regard because, it's, of course, it's a very isolated uh, um, place, and the the fact that these types of solutions, solar and storage, are already displacing um, traditional generation on the island. They're actually using solar power at night. Yeah. Um, is, is is I think quite phenomenal. Um, of course, it's it's a low hanging fruit because uh, the cost of importing uh, diesel or fuel oil to run in power stations in Hawaii is uh, is much higher than it would be sure. in the continental US. But nonetheless, it shows you the shifts uh, already underway. 
Yeah, and we've seen both, well, you know, solar in the last 10 years and, and continuing to do so. And of course, storage in the last few years, those price price points are continuing to drop. So it may be, as you say, a, a sort of a, a relatively low hanging fruit now, but it's the, the fact that you can have dispatchable energy and demonstrate that and overcome all of these intermittency myths and arguments that still float around in some circles that uh, these projects have been deployed and it's only a matter of time, I think, before the cost curve comes down to, to have other places uh, able to, to do the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there are already markets where seeing that becoming increasingly likely as well. I think in places like South America, uh, Chile, for instance, uh, you, you very soon see the same things. That solar on its own is very cheap, but um, there's only so much you can uh, you can add to a system before you start needing um, to be able to uh, deploy it at different points in time. So rather than providing it all during the day, put it in the evening where it's actually uh, actually required. And uh, so these facilities are a good way of, of demonstrating that, that that can be done and is being done. It's it's no longer a you know, theoretical thing and it, it's uh, it's difficult to disprove because you know the projects are actually there, you can go and look at them. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things from the argument, going back to uh, again, I think you, you and I've been around long enough to, to you know uh, hear the, the intermittency uh, excuses and arguments still. But uh, uh, in that particular story, talking about the uh, the volatility of uh, of the prices of fossil fuels being one of the factors that uh, further enabled the, uh, the the purchasers to to, to commit to these um, projects. Yeah, well, I mean that that's. Uh, it's certainly a factor, and it's always the variable that's it's impossible to predict in a, in advance where um, where prices are, are going to go. But uh, I mean, the beauty of, of uh, likes of solar and storage of it's paired together is is you don't have that um, that volatility. The energy is effectively free, and uh, and uh, you've you've got a natural hedge against it. Yeah. Um, but it, even so, like if you just turn to even standalone storage in the in the US again, where this is mostly being deployed from more of a peaking perspective, so these longer duration systems, four hours thereabouts, the cost of um, of a standalone storage four hour facility, uh, again, this is one of the really interesting things I saw in the uh, emerging last year from various analysts, but they, they confirm what we've been saying for quite some time, which is the cost, uh, capital cost, so forget about the fuel cost and life cycle cost of a battery storage plant is already cheaper than of a gas peaker. And that just completely changes the equation because it used to be that we'd have to, you know, come up with a, a value stack over over the life of a, a storage project to demonstrate why a utility should consider it as an option. Yeah. Uh, and that was already an effective argument. But now when you come in and say, well, capital cost of a battery, it's cheaper than the peaker. It can meet the same resource need of, you know, three, four hours, which is a pretty common runtime for, for a lot of these peakers. And then it doesn't have any fuel risk. The fuel is free, helping integrate renewables. It's more efficient. It's, it's cleaner. There's no permits. It's faster to build. You know, it, it's just an avalanche. So I can see this being a huge, a huge market for, uh, you know, the next five years. Yeah, and I think that's certainly something we'll, we'll, we'll return to shortly. One of the stories that, that flagged up before, but before we leave Hawaii, that's also uh, again one of the, the the stories and another sort of uh, groundbreaking or record-breaking uh, project, which was an AES project, also on uh, is it Kuana, the one of the Hawaiian islands? Yeah, that, uh, that's right. So that um, that project was inaugurated uh, within the last week um, uh, as well. So 28 megawatt solar project and a, a 20 megawatt five hour. Um, uh, battery, uh, and that was uh, that was procured. It's the same sort of solicitation that uh, that we just talked about with the eight dollar cent um, per kilowatt hour PPA, but it was mm -hmm. from two years earlier, and it's now obviously operational. So the other ones are uh, a yep. few years out still, um, and that was done at eleven uh, eleven dollar cents. So still a very competitive price, and um, compared to the cost of um, the peaking generation that they're running in the evening in in Hawaii, I understand that's somewhere around um, the thirty six dollar cents mark. So this is a third of the price of, of running yeah. the, the conventional generation. And of course, without burning any of the any any fossilized dinosaur, which is always a good thing. Yeah, always a good thing. OK, so going back to this peaker plant thing, because that's something for, that that, that uh, uh, has frustrated me uh, over the years. And again, in the UK, I know only a matter of a couple of years ago, there was a sort of a, a big influx of, of diesel gensets playing into sort of the, the, the peaker market. Um, the, the story that you flagged around uh, eight, uh, was it eight minutes energy, um, talking around, uh, again, being uh, cheaper to deploy solar and, sto uh, solar and storage by a factor of two. Yeah. So, uh, and the the 
I don't know, the headline that, that jumped out at me there was who in their right mind would build a new gas peaker today. And I think that's a sign of, of things to come. There's certain utilities that are still very traditional in their mindsets and often the ones that, uh, that, that in the US are, are lagging behind is because they're using outdated numbers. It, it is not a recognition of quite how quickly uh, storage of costs have fallen in the past few years. And if you take something yeah. from you know, even two years ago, it, the economics are very different from, uh, from now. So that learning curve has been significant. I, I, I say it, it really uh, jumped out that that factor of two. I, I don't know how uh, specifically they've done that calculation, but I expect it's aside from being cheaper on a capex basis, which we've uh, you know we've already talked about. Yeah. Opex wise, um, if you look at you know 20, 25 years typical life of uh, uh, you know. You, a peaker or a um, battery project that you could build, that over that sort of um, time frame, um, the fuel avoided fuel costs and uh, other benefits that you you have of integrating uh, renewables to the grid probably make up the other half of the 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 equation. So uh, I, I thought that was really interesting because it's just just a sign of again where where these markets are uh, evolving and changing, and it's yeah. again it's just one one market one application. Peakers are, are one of you know a dozen different things you can do with with battery storage but it's just an interesting one because the market is is uh, you know tends to hook well hundreds of gigawatts globally but certainly in the, the tens of gigawatts um for potential for replacement and uh, uh renewal in the united states over the next uh, few years yeah and i think that's the the scale uh, which i obviously also impacts on on costs but uh one of the other items in the uh the, the story flagged was uh one of the uh, i think it's one of the mentioned directors from uh, benchmark mineral in, mineral intelligence saying that uh, um yeah, with well, projects now in themselves being planned at gigawatt scale when only 18 months ago 300 megawatt installation was something to behold it's just that scaling up so significantly that shouldn't surprise us because solar's done it time and time again both in terms of the cost curve and its uh, ability to to deliver um but storage you know it's dangerous i think to align storage and solar too much but you can certainly tr take a, a number of uh, um examples of where the cost curves are repeating and uh, the, 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 the scale of what should or could be developed in 2019-20, uh, looking at the uh, the main sort of research houses like Navigant is, is phenomenal. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I, I always take, you know, when you see the uh, one of my favorite measures of this, I'm trying to remember who, who it is that does this renewal every year. Um, but the, the graph that I really love is seeing the uh, the IEA uh, prediction of, of solar yeah. growth every year where they, you know, every year it's it's shot up vertically and then they draw a horizontal line. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's sort of the same thing with the batteries. Like we get very excited, you know, 20, 2018 being, a, you know, a, a landmark year where there was, you know, this huge growth of, of storage globally. But again, if you look out on the on the curve that Bloomberg New Energy Finance and others predict out to 2030, we are, you know, fraction of the potential of, of, I think it's 350 gigawatt hours of storage that's expected by uh, by 2030. So, in uh, in just about 10 years, um, we're at the very beginning. We're going to remember we're on an exponential uh, growth curve, and, um, and we're staring up it. So, it's, it's really not surprising that the size of these projects is getting bigger. Um, I I made some sort of bold predictions earlier at the, the start of the year, and we'll see how many of them. Uh, come true. They're they're in the public domain, so we'll be <laughs> up on them. But one of them was that this will be the year that conversation goes from millions of, of pounds and megawatts to, to billions and gigawatts. It certainly seems to be a, a fair shout, and it'd be interesting to see how that does pan through. I think one of the interesting things also is we, we work for, or Hyperion, we work with LG Chem, for example, and a couple of other battery lithium companies. They're still very convinced that there's mileage yet for both uh, significant improvements in energy density and, and cost reduction before uh, the, the sort of the, the, the capabilities of, uh, of lithium batteries are, are, are done. Uh, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that, but also wanted to touch on other uh, chemistries and technologies, longer duration solutions, uh, be that from flow batteries through to um, uh, high view power, doing some interesting sort of potentially 100 uh, megawatt plus uh, schemes in sort of uh, uh, liquefied oxygen, I think it is. So have you a take or either personally or through Fluence in terms of at what point other technologies and other chemistries uh, might uh, have uh, some of the successes that lithium have had? 
Yeah, um, well, I, I can share a sort of personal view. This wouldn't be necessarily a, a, a fluent one, but uh, organizationally, we're, I mean, we're set up to be agnostic, and that's that's quite uh, deliberate. We're not a manufacturer yeah. of, uh, of battery cells, and so we we always pick whichever the best technology is for a specific application. Um, actually, in the portfolio of projects we've done, we, we've not just done lithium, and of course, there are even different lithium chemistries there. We have done some flow. We've done some lead acid, some sodium sulfur. Um, so a few systems here and there. Dominant um, in the in the last few years, it's it's all moved very much towards lithium ion just because of that cost curve. I yeah. think agree with with that assessment that there's significant mileage. It, it's the it's not just the cost; it is the density. Those are both important aspects um, to to why this is improving at an exponential rate compared to other uh, technologies. So, flow, for instance, we've looked at, and you can reduce the cost of electrolyte. But you can't reduce the density or improve mm. the density of it, and so it's it's sort of just a different order of uh, of scaling because you always need the same amount of kit to build everything else um, to to make a project work. So uh, what I actually uh, see that I mean, it's still some runway on on uh, the lithium stuff, but ultimately yeah. as those costs come down, longer and longer duration. Um, lithium ion based battery storage becomes uh, viable so we're already talking about you know four or five hour battery systems here in, in most of these conversations that's happening in places where there's more of this energy shifting need it's a yeah. bit different from what we're mostly seeing in the uk at the moment um but that could easily increase from f to five six seven eight hours um so for anything that's on a sort of daily cycle a day to night shifting um Electrochemical batteries are actually uh, ideal. When you get to um, essentially the later problem, which is how do you get to 100% renewables, you'll yeah. uh, you'll start to need seasonal storage. And at that point, uh, unless there's a step change in 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 sort of electrochemical battery technology, uh, that's where you need to see things like uh, you know compressed air, liquid air, um, um, power to gas. Um, you know, longer duration storage that can last uh, weeks or or months. So that that's something I think is beyond currently what we see under uh, is the limitations of of, uh, of batteries. But for getting to 50, 60, 70, 80 percent renewables, um, you know, this is the this is the technology that's helping us get there at the moment. That's interesting. I think one of the other aspects, of course, is always the funding thing, and uh, it is uh, talking to, uh, to to some of the companies we work in in in, in sort of more innovative uh, um, uh, chemistries is the fact that it's just so hard to get anything that isn't lithium um, funded or financed to any significant scale. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's largely because. Prove it, like the track record of, of lithium batteries goes back to the 70s, so it, mm. it's very proven as a as a technology. It was just really putting it in a new application. I mean, um, a predecessor of, of Fluence AES Energy Storage started back in sort of 2006, 2007, and was the first company to actually put together a battery for uh, for, for stationary storage on on the grid. Yeah. And they managed to do that on on the back of saying, look, listen, this is a mature technology batteries have been used in devices for for 30 years um we're just using it in a new application um so it it it's difficult for that to uh, to be incubated at scale i would say um no investor is just going to come in for a you know it's a gigawatt hour size project and, and bet on a chemistry that hasn't been hasn't been proven but you know, we we incubate the way we approach projects. We're, we're agnostic as a solution provider, and uh, and we work with you know new promising technologies as much as as um, the large scale ones as well. And so we we do test them out, and we do look out for ones that are that are going to you know hit the hit the commercial prime time in in the near future. At some point, it was interesting again watching your uh, TEDx talk, which we'll put into the link of the uh, podcast episode. Um, going back to sort of Thomas Edison using battery. The electric vehicles, which will come on to uh, around the turn of the century, when uh, I think you was 30, 40 percent of uh, vehicles in the U.S. were were electric powered. So, uh, as you say, it's uh, uh, nothing nothing new. Yeah, it's uh, well, uh, as I mentioned in that talk, if you go back to the origins of this, we're actually talking about. Um, I mean, the first idea of the battery uh, was really Alessandro Voltaire in 1799. So, even uh, you know, 120 years before. Uh, uh, sort of the first sort of power grid stuff. There's there were already the idea of of a battery, at least in a in a rudimentary form. Mm. 
So it's difficult not to talk about e-mobility, and I think it is a, a, a significant factor of assistance as we as we really converge and, and get to this point of, of potentially the electrification of everything. So before we touch on sort of some of the use cases or, or, or areas such as V2G, where where storage and uh, and e-mobility could work uh, in tandem, just the the significant uptake in the in the sort of the the, the number of electric vehicles that are coming to market and the, and the sheer demand now for for batteries um uh, again do you have a take on uh, it's easy to point around sort of supply issues and uh, from my research that there doesn't appear to be any but uh, it, it seems to have only been uh, something which accelerates the uh, uh, improvement of lithium batteries rather than posing a challenge to stationary storage for example yeah, for for the most part, there's we're we're riding as a as a sort of stationary storage provider on the coattails of the the electric vehicle industry. That uh, and this is you know when you're just coming back to comparing uh, technologies as well. One of the big advantages is is the scale at which I mean electric vehicles and the transportation sector as a whole dwarfs what what we're uh, what we're doing. So the the level of uh, innovation, scale, production that's going into uh, decreasing costs, improving density is something that we're just taking advantage of. We're using, um, uh, you know, the same same essentially technology, the same cells effectively for stationary uh, storage purposes. So we're really benefiting in in uh, in direct correlation to EV uptake yeah. um, by all the all the stuff that's going in on the on the supply side. Uh, whether EVs are a competitor to um, to stationary storage. I, I mean, that's that's a question still to be determined for the for the future. I, again, my personal view on this is is actually they're quite complementary. It it really depends on how EV uh, usage changes in the future. And I think we we as a society are very good at, at just extrapolating from yeah. where we are today and thinking you know in a in a linear mindset as opposed to what can radically change. Um, and if if everyone continues to use cars in the same way they have, but they're just electric you plug them in at home that's that's one world because you've you've got these batteries that are in the home sat there not being used for a lot of the hours of the day and if you can figure out the smart grid side of that you can use them for uh, services on the grid however personally i don't think that's the direction that that we're going because we're forgetting two other big uh, uh trends and and that's essentially the uberification of, of transport so yeah People not owning cars, but storage is a, effectively a service. You you call up a, a, a car and it picks you up and takes you somewhere else. And uh, for that reason as well, the the idea of autonomous vehicles, um, so no longer people driving the cars. So you just got these you know fleets of vehicles taking you from A to B, and that's a very different electric vehicle infrastructure world because yeah. if you if you got cars moving around everywhere, they need fast chargers. That if you're a, a fleet um, owner and you own electric vehicles that are going to be running around making money for you, you need to, to have them on the road as many hours of a day as possible and only plug in and, and charge uh, for a short time before they're back out on the road again. And in that sort of world, you need essentially a buffer between the grid and the vehicle because otherwise you're going to have these big spikes of, of, of demand for short periods in unpredictable places. Um, so there, there I actually, my personal view is it's a huge opportunity for um, stationary storage as well when we get onto this transmission and distribution yeah. infrastructure because batteries are perfect for offering this sort of buffer to the grid and enabling the infrastructure to be to be built. Yeah, no, absolutely right, and that's uh, I'm sure you've seen the the pivot per Matt, Matt Allen and pivot power who who was on one of the earlier podcasts. Uh, their sort of business proposition is partially around that. Uh, aside from standalone uh, stationary storage, is uh, is to create this uh, buffer between fast charging and and the grid. Uh, and um, equally, I think you're quite right. I think too often people just think of uh, life changing in an iterative process that will just swap a load of ice cars for a load of EV cars, and I don't think for, for uh, at all that's going to be the case. I think looking at some of the the um, statistics, statistics over the last year or two, I think it's quite uh, plausible to suggest we've reached peak car globally. Um, you know, obviously, you can argue that there's more and more coming into China, but generally, I think uh, you see less and less uh, millennials wanting to drive cars. You see, obviously, a lot of urbanization and, and, uh, and people moving to cities, and in cities, cars are not necessarily a, a great solution. So, uh, likewise, I think that the whole uh, mobility scene will, will change significantly and, and, and the infrastructure accordingly, um, uh, and it won't necessarily just mean that we need lots more batteries in lots more places. Absolutely. Uh, this is, uh, 
uh, this is more of an anecdote than anything else, but uh, I guess the plural of anecdote can be considered to be data. Uh, on my, my street, I live in uh, in Amsterdam and uh, you please, or expect to hear maybe that I, I don't own a car here. I'm, I'm just on a bike, but actually our street had um, had parking for, for cars on, on both sides of the of the road and the councils come in and actually um, put in flower beds uh, yeah. in half the parking spaces and then put bike racks in the other half. So cars are now being completely pushed out of the city centre for uh, uh, for I guess air quality reasons, for um, quality of life and everything else, and I was actually really pleased by the uh, by the decision. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good thing, and again, it's happening elsewhere, largely around the the air pollution issues of, of cities banning diesels initially, and and obviously potentially then other other vehicles. But again, it just comes back to this point of of the way that we live our lives changing significantly. And another um, uh, recent podcast uh, contributor, Lucas Neckerman, has written a book about smart mobility and smart cities, and how that sort of whole uh, ecosystem will will, will change. Um, and uh, uh, there's lots of parts to that. The scooters seem to be very uh, much proliferating everywhere at the moment, electric scooters, that is. Um, of course, you say, say Lyft and Uber uh, playing a big part. I think it's going to be a really fascinating few years, but I, I think the direction of travel is definitely towards uh, one of electrification and one of, uh, of just much smarter grids and much smarter thinking. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, electric vehicles, really obvious that trend is is happening. The big, the f- sort of final question mark uh, is uh, around the, the the last sector, which is heat. And heat is obviously a huge uh, uh, energy use uh, for us as well. It's where a good chunk of the, of the energy goes. Uh, that can be electrified as well. Um, you can you know go down the route of heat pumps. That one's maybe a little bit less certain, but certainly, uh, I mean, adding all of the uh, uh, transport energy that we use into into the electricity value chain itself is a huge opportunity because it, it actually we talk a lot about um or, or has been in recent years the the likes of you know potential utility death spiral people yep. moving off grid and so on one of the big uh, saving graces for uh, i think for utilities that are worried about that is if they can get the business model right on enabling electric vehicle infrastructure because rather than it just being uh, you know energy efficiency and um essentially self-consumption reducing more and more the energy that's on the grid and uh, it becoming less and less relevant uh, adding evs to the grid is adding many you know it's a huge boost to demand growth which is yeah. an interesting world to to be in because it's the opposite trend of what we were seeing a while ago yeah, yeah. um and, and that creates the opportunities because the network is needed and if you've got it like in a uh, uh, you know developed mature uh, uh, country with that infrastructure, it makes sense to use it. In other places, where you know we operate in sub-Saharan Africa as well, it's it's potentially quite different in places, and you might just see microgrids uh, emerge without the uh, without that connectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the, going back to sort of future trends that I see evolving, um, uh, mobility as a service. We've sort of touched on the fact that you won't necessarily own a car; you're just close an app or, or, or choose an app and whether it's a bus, a plane or a train or a scooter or what depends on where you go in and at what time. Um, energy as a service, again, is another conversation uh, uh, that, that comes up from time to time. And I, I try to speak to sort of uh, people outside of the sector and uh, sort of use the analogy of a, of a phone. You just pay a flat fee for a month and you get all your calls and texts and everything else. How do you see the evolution of energy as a service? Uh, are you talking here about so, so not electric vehicles per se. This is about energy, uh, energy infrastructure, energy. Uh, or, uh, yeah, just as uh, whether that's on a residential or on a CNI basis of of essentially paying a, a fee for. Because again, there are in offices now you can actually pay for light. You don't pay for the lighting or the light fittings or anything else. Somebody else looks after that. You just pay for light and you pay for it when it's on. Um, so th- those sort of models where essentially you're you're paying for a service, you know, the services that you've got heating or the services that you've got light or your TV works or your factory uh, runs, but you don't have to worry about how that's done. You just pay for the for the service. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And of course, it's emerged in, in a lot of spaces. We've had that with, uh, well, you have it with, with Uber, you have it with Spotify, Netflix and, uh, and other things. And and there is there's a strong element of truth that, you know, with our system is still a bit archaic. We pay for kilowatt hours, but it's not the kilowatt hours we enjoy. It's the result of those kilowatt hours. Yeah. You're really not paying for uh, um, yeah, for the kilowatt hours you're paying for the lumens, the actual light that you get, or the you know, food being cooked, and so on. Um, so it's an interesting uh, idea. Uh, it, it could could well catch on. Um, that you you know use as much as well as much as you like. I guess it's the opposite uh, intention um, that's what you'd have. But as long as you're getting uh, you know getting the use without compromising your quality of life, and you don't have to think about it. I think to some. 
uh, subset of society, that's going to be um, really interesting to to others. I think it might be a horrifying idea because it, it, it you know sort of takes away the the idea of thinking about um, how we use energy and what the value of it is um, because you know you, because then you're not directly exposed to it. So it can go in a completely opposite direction, which is you know very much more uh, active time of use um, and and really having to consider when and how you use energy. Um, Potentially, it's a hybrid of the two where, uh, you know, a customer doesn't have to think about that. Um, and there's some sort of smart behind the scenes platform that is interfacing with this mm. complex world of, of uh, you know, tariffs and time of use charges. Um, I, it's probably beyond my expertise to say where that goes, um, but it's interesting to think about uh, about both. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. I hadn't thought of that as a concept because I know Zonon, for example, certainly in Germany have a Zonon community where you, uh, again, and uh, there's the ability to have a flat rate where, uh, A, you can do peer-to-peer -peer trading of, of your uh, energy uh, across the, 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 the network. The obvious one is if it's sunny in Bavaria and cold in Berlin, you can peer-to-peer -peer trade across that. Um, but also to go in towards that model of a subscription, you know, apart from anomalies or excessive use, you, you pay a subscription, your lights go on and your, your fridge works and everything else. But um I hadn't thought about that that you touched on there is again people energy is actually much cheaper than it could or should be in, in many regards and uh, as you say people flick a switch and don't actually appreciate what's what's happened to enable uh, that light to come on yeah well to an extent we do we do take it to uh for granted it is there's a lot of cleverness that goes on behind the scenes to actually make <laughs> make that light switch come on we're so uh so used to having it just work and, and function perfectly that uh, that we don't often give it a lot of thought. Yeah, at the same time, you know, I we, I struggle a little bit with the idea of you know the Earth Hour and so on, where you, you encourage mm. to switch off lights. It, in a way, it's good because it does encourage you to think about uh, about energy consumption and uh, and uh, and the fact that we are using the resources we have on the planet at a, a very rapid rate, which is the whole challenge that that we have. But on the other, fundamentally, energy storage, uh, sorry, energy in in general, um, access to it is a fundamental right. Um, mm. It's 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 something that that we should in a way all take for granted that we uh, that, uh, that that we do have and um, that it that you know that we can prosper and live because of all the things that it actually enables us to do. Um, I don't know really where I, I go with that point. Other than mm. it's just interesting uh, to to reflect on where you know what we uh, what we do actually do with energy and uh, how we use it. Yeah. Yeah, it's that whole education piece uh, around, isn't it? But uh, it's that's that that's also difficult when <laughs> the landscape is you know changing almost on a on a daily basis. When you start looking at, uh, uh, as I should say, the electrification of various uh, forms of heat and or transport, and uh, how we uh, generate electrons and and how we use them, how we store them, which I think this makes the, the, this this the fun place to to, to be. D talk a little bit about your journey here, because again, uh, I know that um, you know this is something for for which you have a passion. But you studied engineering, I believe. So tell us a little bit of, of the journey of how you came to be where you are yeah so i yeah, i studied uh engineering uh, at university uh, i actually ended up specializing in uh in civil engineering but i did a general degree at, at durham in the in the uk so i covered a little bit of electrical mechanical and everything else which in, in the end has come out to be really handy yeah. um, but i guess the main thing to say is you know if i go back then to it was about 2009 so 10 years ago now um, uh, graduating from uh, from from that degree, I I could not possibly have said where I would be now ten years on. Like I wouldn't have really even thought about this job having existed. Um, it just goes to show you how fast the disruption uh, curve of technology is, and yeah. you know what we're studying for at university um, it may well be giving us a career in something that we have we have uh, you know no idea we're going to get involved in. I, I thought I was going to go into civil engineering, and um, I got a, a job at uh, a sort of structural engineering consultancy, uh, who promptly fired me before I even started the job because of the recession. Uh, it's a great start to a to a illustrious career, um, but uh, I mean that actually. Is where uh, I had my real sort of break, I guess, my real opportunity, because I, I then looked at uh, other things I could do, and, and one of them was this engineering doctorate, which is like a PhD based in in industry, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, had a sort of mentor who was at AES, um, who's now the parent company of uh, Affluence. I went to work for for AES at that time. Um, really just looking more generally about the challenges of intermittency of, of renewable energy and what it would mean for mature power markets. So it was a real per precursor to what I was doing now. Yeah. Uh, 
but I, I in some ways I sort of, you know started working on on the side of, of the enemy I was always a bit more of a you know sustainability minded eco warrior and I went for uh, for working what was uh, a, a very big owner of uh, conventional generation Power assets yeah yeah huge huge uh, opportunity for me there though because I I learned the inside and out of how different power stations work you know coal plant uh, gas plant uh, combined cycle open cycle um, got a, a great vocation in all of that and that really helped um, you know my understanding of, of uh, you know system flexibility and what the limitations and capabilities are of conventional plant uh, there were a lot of things that were being taken for granted that you could only provide from conventional generation and now we're seeing actually you know batteries can displace a lot of those jobs and do them uh, order of magnitude better um, so that was a great place to uh, to start. Um, and then I got involved at the end of that, still working for AES, but developing one of the UK's first uh, battery energy storage projects um, with the longest running in operation since uh, since 2015, uh, Kilroot Power Station in Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Um, and then from that side, I was asked to move from from being the customer to essentially, uh, you know, being on the solution provider side and I moved to Amsterdam about three years ago now to uh, to help set up and scale um, our energy storage uh, business. It's uh, quite a journey. I think why don't you touch on something interesting there, and it's something as uh, a parent of young children. I read recently a report and and, uh, and was writing around the topic of uh, you know future work, uh, and uh, read in the New York Times a, a report. Uh, I'll try and reference it, but uh, uh, suggesting that for for kids of around sort of eight nine years old, uh, eighty percent of the jobs that they'll end up doing don't yet exist, and I think that's a real. Um, challenge for all of us whether it be in clean tech or fintech or, or any other part of the the, the economy is to uh, how do we prepare people for a world that doesn't yet exist yeah no it, it, it's absolutely uh, the case i said well eight, forget eight or nine years old when i was uh, whatever it was 20 21 22 it was the same situation like i ended up going into a in, into a job i wouldn't have thought that existed at the time and probably anyone who uh, told me it, it, it would have done um it was crazy thinking so i, I yeah I, i'm passionate about this as well i like to uh, uh to to go in and I do it both at schools i used to be a stem now ambassador okay. uh, going into schools when i was in the uk but i still do it i lecture at universities do some sort of pro bono ones and just uh, you know explain what we're doing and, and where the opportunities are as if nothing else it shows that this is a you know real and vibrant industry and you know another 10 years it could be something completely different again uh, you can frame it as a challenge um but it's also uh, i think what's really exciting about the future is we you know we're we're building and doing new things that haven't ever been thought of before yeah 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 and obviously every challenge is an opportunity also but uh, so I appreciate that you, you you touched earlier on some of the predictions you've made for the year in 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 closing and, and perhaps not just your predictions but you know just a general view on what you see as the significant events and or opportunities that 2019 will throw up for for storage in particular or for for at least for the clean tech sector. Yeah. So well, it depends if it's a global or, or a UK focus here, and I'm probably more uh, more. Uh, uh, in a position to comment on the UK stuff because I, I know it a little bit more intimately, but certainly, sure. I mean, the, the general trend I talked about earlier, um, say megawatts and, and millions to gigawatts and billions, we're already seeing that with some of the sizes of funds that have, have been sort of put in place for building out storage assets. And there's, there's certainly various project developers and so on have big ambitions in that regard. And we're, mm -hmm. we're starting to get towards those sort of numbers, um, huge projects in, in the UK and, and the US and uh, other places as well. Um, so I think that, that one's likely to, to come true um pretty pretty quickly we'll we'll get to you know gigawatts of storage being built out um you know in very small numbers of projects um we're already seeing this you know last year was really the year where it was a tipping point projects being built out for sort of single use short duration applications like ffr yeah uh, are now moving towards you know longer duration more merchant which requires a lot more getting your head around but again there's it is a deep market there's gigawatts of um, flexibility and balancing that is needed to the grid, uh, increasingly so as we add more more EVs and um, potentially after March 31st, we'll see what happens, but um, maybe need yeah. to a little bit more on uh, generation uh, within uh, within the, the boundaries of the UK. Um, but but that you know that that's potentially really interesting uh, trend the move towards merchant uh, markets because I think investors are getting comfortable with that and that creates yeah. a much deeper um, uh, deeper set of requirements if you can design storage assets the right way to uh, to handle that. Um, 
other than that, lots of other interesting things going on. Um, I've been watching with interest the uh, the sort of the trading platforms for DNOs, these sort of marketplaces for uh, for storage and yeah. other you know, third party flexibility services. It's quite a different approach to what we've seen in the US and and Australia. Uh, it's sort of the going at it from the opposite end, but. Those are really interesting trials, and be be curious to see how how they end up working, and if if there's sufficient liquidity in those markets. Um, so those are probably some of the main main things that I think are, are interesting in the UK um, and globally. There's there's you know plenty more. I think the US is again still very very much going full full speed ahead, and a lot of other yeah. countries ramping up. Super. Okay. Well, I appreciate your thoughts on that. I appreciate your time today. One thing I like to to close on, as a sort of an avid reader of, of uh, of books, is the or which, if any, books over the last year have had the most impact on you. Yeah, I, uh, this it's a good question. I, I actually set myself, and I've set myself the same goal this year. But last year, one of my New Year's resolutions was to read a book a month because I was finding I was not finding the time to to read as much as I would like. And of the twelve that I read last year, one that really stood out to me, I, I picked a whole eclectic mix of different ones that people had recommended to me. But Thinking Fast and Slow um, by Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel okay. laureate. Um, for uh, economics, so a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist slash psychologist. And I found that a fascinating book because it was all sort of a mixture of economics and, and, and psychology. So talking about cognitive biases, uh, prospect yep. theory, uh, things, um, it, just happiness in general, like how we, uh, you know, how psychologically we geared to being, uh, you know, happy or not. And it just sort of linking between the, the title of the book refers to sort of the fast mind, the, the limbic system, the primitive mind and the slow logical uh, thoughtful mind that we think actually, you know, governs the way we behave when in fact it's much more the, uh, the, the reactionary and limbic mind. Yeah, that no, sounds interesting. I've, uh, that sounds uh, perhaps a little like uh, the uh, the chimp paradox, actually, by um, Professor Steve Peters. I think it is. I, I set myself a target of twenty for this year, so I'm always keen for, for suggestions. I'll be be sure to to check that out. So, Mar thank you very much for joining us today. Really uh, enjoyed the conversation. We'll post up the uh, links to the various stories we've touched on today, uh, along with your your TED talk and to uh, to, to fluence and all, and uh, get that shared around. And uh, appreciate your time. And I'm I'm sure we'll catch up on an event or. So in the near future. Yeah, sure. Well, likewise, thanks very much for, for the invitation and uh, enjoyed the chat. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for joining us again on the This Week in Clean Tech podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if so, please do share it with friends, colleagues, and any social media platforms as it really does help us out. Next week, we will be back with the CEO of a leading renewable energy developer. Make sure you join us again for that one. We look forward to seeing you there and goodbye.